tenth day of September 2018, allegedly, according to that thing we call a calendar. This, indeed, is the Ocelli Effect, broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com, but you probably already know that if you found this show. Anyway... <laughs> Here we are. It is a Monday, a moon day. We're beginning our broadcast week, and thankfully we have Jordan Maxwell back with us now. Jordan has been doing this series. We've had a couple of weeks off from it. Last week I didn't even do a show on Monday because I just did not feel as though I wanted to do anything but get Jordan back on. So here it is. I took the Monday off, uh, and, and there were other issues as well. But But anyway, either way, I usually show up for it. We are here on a Monday. Of course, if you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, that is the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. Okay, just let's keep that nice and clear. jordanmaxwellshow.com, that's where you can go. Now, when you go there, there's a button for the Research Society, and I urge you to click on it and join the Research Society because you'll get in depth with a lot of topics, including the thing that we're covering in this very extensive series, which we're now on part eight, I believe. Part eight of the series on religion in general, and it, it stops when Jordan says we're done, uh, and that's the way it's going to go. We're going to continue on, and this is the eighth part. So here we go. Now, there were two weeks off here. One week Jordan didn't feel well. One week Jordan was <laughs> off at a conference, so he had things to do. But uh, we have been uh, uh, certainly anxiously awaiting his return so we could continue on. I only have one question in the hopper so far for him. But if you guys want to in the chat room or if you're on my Skype list or even if you email during the course of this show tonight, I will add the question into the conversation. So there you go. Anyway, Jordan. It's uh, it's a Monday, one day before the September 11th observance, and here we are, <laughs> continuing wow. on with this series. How how are you, my friend? Well, Chuck, I'm always delighted to be able to talk with you. I haven't been well for <clears throat> some time, and I really got pretty sick uh, you know, the last couple of weeks, and so many other things I had to do. But um, delighted to be back on the radio with you, and. Uh, I think I'm okay for the moment. Not, not. I'm about as well as I can be at 78 years old. <clears throat> but um, I still am very, very excited about talking to the world about my work and, and what I have found over the many years of of just wandering through this mire and this incredible world that we live in. <clears throat> It's so extraordinary the the knowledge which has been hidden, and which very you know uh, here and there and everywhere I'm meeting extraordinary people who have been doing research and and, and are very well. Uh, would I get what I would call world class authorities on so many arcane subjects, people. Uh, uh, there are so many subjects people don't even know exist that need to be talked about in public, <clears throat> but nobody seems to know anything about these subjects, so we, we we just miss out on so much. And that's what I try and do, is bring new ideas and, and, and some really extraordinary people that I've met and just air out the, the ideas that I've heard over the years from all sorts of writers and authors, lecturers and teachers. The world is very, very strange that we live in. And it's getting, I don't think it's getting stranger, but, but it's becoming more obvious, I think, is what's happening. Mm. <clears throat> that people are beginning to awaken to the fact that nothing is what you think it is. The entire world uh, that we live in is based on other things that we don't even know exist. And, uh, and so we don't know how our world works. Even the Bible has God saying of, of, uh, of the Christian people, uh, the scripture says, my people are dying from a lack of knowledge. <clears throat> and, uh, there's another scripture that I have, I think is probably the most important thing I've ever read in the Bible that says, where there is no vision, the people perish. 
And that is exactly what we are experiencing today. Where there is no vision, the people perish. <clears throat> That's a scripture in the Bible. But what it's basically saying is when the human family uh, has lost its sight, it's lost sight of, of what it is and what it's supposed to be, if it's lost its vision of, 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 of the world that we live in, and you don't know how the world works, you don't know why or how you got here and where you're going when you leave, you know, there's so much for the human mind to experience and know. But if you don't know, you know, the people just die never realizing what was going on. And I've thought to myself how terrible it would be. This was in my mind even as a kid. How terrible it would be to wake up at, say, 90 years old in, a, in an old folks' home or whatever and, <clears throat> and never, ever realize all of the knowledge and wisdom and strangeness of life that you never knew. You never knew any of the incredible knowledge that was there for you to learn, uh, you know, from from you know, the solar system and how it works to where humans have come from, the ancient and prehistoric history of the world and, and the earth that you live on. There's just so much that we really don't know and don't see and don't look at. So that's why the scripture really hits me that, where there is no vision, the people perish. Well, so, and, and, and part of it, you know, a lot of people would say, it, you know, they, they blame the individuals out there that are ignorant, basically, of the world around them. And, and they say, you know, that, that people uh, have decided to remain in ignorance. And some people have, Jordan. I mean, let's be honest. There are people that are resigned to or married to their ignorance, so to speak. And oh, they've chosen... Right. They've chosen to keep the blinders on. They've chosen to keep plugs in their ears. But really, truthfully, even those of us that wish to seek knowledge must also first acknowledge that we have been misdirected since birth. Because we've been given names for things which we do not know the meanings of. We have been given labels for different types of things and different understandings of systems which are not accurate. The labels are not accurate based on the meanings we've been taught, and the labels are not even fully accurate based on their true meanings in some cases. Although, when you begin to line the two up, you can see why there has been a deception, and you can see the directionality of the grand deception. What do I mean by this? Initially, as a child, right, and I think we need, we need to take it all the way back to that. As a child, what are you taught as an American child? Well, you're a little older than me, Jordan, but still, in my generation, we were taught, you know, this government is here because it is protecting your freedom. We were taught the churches are here because they are people of God and they are here to help. And they are here to do God's work on earth. That is what they are meant to do. And in some ways, there are people that truly believe in these things and truly lay their faith, not only in the government, but in their predecessors, in the system, in the organization of religion, in the organization of uh, local municipalities, the exchange of goods and services and energy and all of it. But the truth is that even the language we're attempting to use to decipher the system around us was already preset to be turned against us, to be weaponized, if you will. It's almost as if everything in the world, whether it be a, a benign description or an ethos, it doesn't matter. It's all been weaponized to be turned against anyone who wishes to walk a clear path who wishes to do the right thing on earth it's like it's like it was designed this way jordan what do you say <laughs> well let me tell you i think i brought this out before but i but it bears witness to say it again now <clears throat> i knew a, a a guy many years ago i knew somebody many years ago that had the talent for being able to tell me what was going to happen to me uh, sometimes a year ahead, six months ahead, 
but he would tell me in minute detail exactly the day and the date and the day and what time of day, exactly what time of day, <clears throat> and where I will be and who I will be with and what I will be wearing and what colors I will be wearing and and the woman and the other man with me, what they're going to be wearing and we're going to be in a particular car and he told me what the car, what color the car was and what it was and what was going to happen and we would all three be there as witnesses and then he would tell me, uh, here's what the girl is going to say and when she says this, this, and that, you are going to say this, this, and that. And, and all of this in minute detail. And be damned if a year later, at uh, that exact date that he said, at that exact time that he said, I'm in the car that he said I would be, and, and everything he said was exactly correct. And especially what I said because I wasn't thinking of it at the time. And when the girl said what she did, I came back and said what I did, not real, not thinking or realizing that's exactly what he said I was going to say. I just said what he told, what, what he told me a year ago I was going to say. And so I, when I tell people that there is someone in the world that can do that, and tell you in, 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 uh, in detail what's going to happen to you a year to two years ahead of time, uh, uh, people will then ask me the wrong question. The first question that comes to the mind is, how in the world can he do that? How is that possible? But that's the wrong question to ask. The correct thing to ask is the mere fact that he can do it. What does that tell you about your freedom in your life? What does that tell you about your life that you are living today? That if someone can tell you two years ahead of time and give you the exact day, month, day, and hour, and what you're going to be wearing and what you're going to say and what's going to happen, and it all happens exactly correct, what does that tell you about your human life on the earth and the so-called your human freedom? What does that tell you about human freedom? It implies, obviously, you don't have any freedom. You may think you have a freedom, but if someone can tell you in exact, uh, in exact detail two years before, that implies that there's some kind of a computerization of life in this universe, some sort of a computer. Uh, I'm just using that because your brain is a computer and your body, your physical body is a biological battery. And that's why if you, get in, if you go to jail, they're going to put you in a cell because your body is a biological battery, and that's what we call batteries, is a cell. And so when you, when you see that your brain is a computer, your body is a battery, and we now understand the concept of Wi-Fi, meaning that many computers can be tuned into one circuit or one source and have different, different programs and different shows all going at the same time from the one source. Well, that's what it looks like now uh, to me that all of us, with our different minds, our different personalities, our different ways of viewing things, but we're all computerized. All of our brains are the same, and there's some kind of a Wi-Fi connection that we have with the divine uh, that people have called God with whatever it is that's out there that is uh, you know, over us. And then when I think about the reaction of, say, fish, and 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 birds. How many times have we seen uh, pictures with thousands and thousands of fish in a school uh, shooting along in the water, and all of a sudden they all turn instantly, instantly they all turn and go an opposite way, and then instantly they turn uh, uh, all at one time, 
and they all turn and go a different way. Well, birds have done that. We see them doing that, where the whole flock of birds will be flying one way, and instantly they turn and go a different way together. Everyone made that decision at that very moment. What does that imply? It implies that there's some kind of an unseen uh, presence over us that seems to be uh, playing out some kind of a pre-programmed life system in this universe. And, and the more I look at the earth and the more I begin to contemplate all that we see out there in our telescopes or planets, and the planets are all beautiful, but they're just round planets with zero, nothing but dirt, but our planet is so consumed with so much life from from, from uh, flying creatures to dinosaurs to fish. Uh, the oceans are filled with life. And all the kinds of life forms that we have on the Earth, where did this, uh, this, this planet we call Earth, where in the hell did it come from? Mm -hmm. And why is it we are so in, uh, inundated with life forms that are coming and going. I mean, the whole systems of life forms die, but that's all right. It's all right because whole systems of life forms are coming into being continually. So you, better, you, you, know, you really need to go back and think about this earth, who we are, how did we get here, and why is it that some people are able to read not only the Akashic record, of the ancient past and tell you things, but they can also tell you in detail what's going to happen to you a year or two or more in the future. What does all of this imply about your life? Well, you it's know, you know what's interesting still. here, Jordan, is that there's actually a question and a comment from two different listeners that fit perfectly into what it is you're saying right now. So I'm going to enter those into the discussion. Uh, yeah. First of all, in the chat room, <clears throat> Uh, a regular listener of the show asks, uh, or basically comments that, uh, he saw a documentary that implied that deer, herd of deer, uh, actually make a decision by voting, it looks like, at least based on the nature observational show, you know, one of those nature shows where they try and show you what the behaviors of particular wild animals are like. Uh, apparently they, they, they appear to almost make, take a vote before they go running. Now, there's lots of systems of organization, and this leads into the question that I have on Skype, which, by the way, if you guys want to enter a question into the chat room, feel free. If you want to enter one on Skype, that's fine. Or email me at info at ocelli.com, and I will read them during the course of this live show and save them if I don't get to them tonight, uh, for Jordan in the future. The question then comes in regarding all the various systems. Now, this is a very long question, but I'm going to get right to the heart of it quickly. Um, you know, regarding all these different systems and how people interact and the concept of the, uh, quote, Christ consciousness between people, the, uh, the, the interconnectivity, that Wi-Fi you were talking about, that natural Wi-Fi. Uh, and they observe all this and they talk about the systems between animals and everything else. But then they ask this interesting question at the very end. Uh, what is Jordan's view on the concept of basically this reality in and of itself being a computer simulation, uh, a la Philip K. Dick? This kind of thing is what they threw in there at the end. But uh, that's really what they want to know is, uh, is what do you think about the idea that we're actually all existing within a computer simulation where perhaps... Uh, someone on a higher level of it, uh, another simulation has programmed it, or potentially the source, the uh, the individual God consciousness has created this entire simulation and all of its complexities uh, according to a numeric algorithm, and uh, we are all existing in something that could be easily predicted if you can see beyond the code. Uh, so that was the question from the listener, and I leave it to you. Well, I think that there is something actually to that. Uh, and, and let me go, let me go on to, to add another dimension to this question. Uh, I had a very dear friend <clears throat> when I met him, he was like 80 years old, and, 
And I, I used to go and visit him all the time. He was an old Navy guy. He was a Navy pilot. <clears throat> and, um, and, and uh, when I was talking with him the last time, he was about 93, 94 years old. And uh, we, uh, we were visiting, I was visiting him in his home and he, uh, with a bunch of other people, and he was telling us about an experience that he had. This is a 94 year old man, <clears throat> a Navy, Navy guy, and, but he was telling me that he was a, a, a squadron leader, I think the term would be, where he was leading a whole group of other planes, and he was the lead uh, captain, and he said we were through, we were in the Bermuda Triangle. And he said, and uh, <clears throat> when you go through the Bermuda Triangle, uh, pilots know, and everybody else who's done it knows that your compasses immediately, once you enter the Bermuda Triangle, your compasses uh, do not work correctly. They immediately turn, your compass turns to true north, not magnetic north. Magnetic north is the way compasses work. But when you go into the Bermuda Triangle, for some reason, uh, compasses point directly to true north. And he said, but he was leading a whole... A group of planes. Uh, he was. They had one, and and, uh, and he was a leader. And he said, and I, I told my co-pilot to take over. I was going to go back in the bathroom, and I was going to take a uh, take a smoke and whatever, and then I'll come back. So he said. So I got up and left the plane to my co-pilot, and I went in the bathroom. And he said, when I came out, I was in a different plane, completely, totally different plane. And he said, and everybody, all the all the guys in that plane, I recognized from that was an old. It was an old airplane I was in, uh, and he said, and their their uniforms were old, uh, you know, military uniforms. And he said, I was absolutely floored. He said, I had no idea in the world what was going on. I'm in a different plane, and he said, then they looked at me. And immediately grabbed me, thinking that I was a stowaway, even though I'm wearing my uniform. They can tell that I'm a, a captain. And he said, and they brought me up to the captain of that plane. And he and the captain jumped at me and said, what are you doing on this plane? And he said, I'm placing you under arrest. He said, and we'll deal with you when we land. And he said, and I told him, no, I, this is my plane. And he said, no, you're in my plane. He said, and I looked at the plane and realized I don't know how to fly this. It's an older model, and I don't know how to fly this thing. But I'm in this, and then this guy's plane, and it's all military, and so was I. And he said, and so I, 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 I went back to just wait until they land. Because I don't know what to say. I don't know what's going on. He says, so I went back into the bathroom, and I came back out, and now I'm back in my plane. And he said, all I'm telling you is that I, you know, at 94 years old, I'm telling you the truth. I was, I, I was in another man's plane. I was in another plane completely. <clears throat> and somehow or another, that happened in the Bermuda Triangle. And so I'm thinking to myself that there's, you know, I've heard all the stories from all the different experts about the different dimensions, but I have myself personally uh, seen things from other time periods, from prehistoric time periods with my own eyes. I have seen things which I know existed millions of years ago, but I saw them just like they were uh, right there in your face on the day I saw them. And so I, I know that there's some kind of a connection that we have in our life today that there are other dimensions which are existing all around us. And of that, there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever because I've seen too much. I have heard too much from other people who don't know each other, and I've talked to people around the world, and I've heard so many stories of people who have who, who are in this dimension but experienced something 
in a dimension which was a million years ago. And so mm. uh, a classic example is the day uh, in Los Angeles that I, uh, it had been a rainy de- a, a, a rainy week, and I knew that the air would be very clear. And so I got up very early in the morning, and I drove up to uh, the Griffith Park Observatory, which is on a high mountain overlooking all of Los Angeles and in, in California coast. And I went up there because I realized it's going to be crystal clear and beautiful, and I want to see Southern California you know, early in the morning when the sun comes up. And I parked the car, and I was the only one. I was the very first one when they opened up the uh, uh, the, the road to the observatory. And I was, seemed to be the only one there at the, at the time. And so I walked out to the observation deck overlooking Southern California by myself. And I'm standing there looking as far east as I could, uh, way out into the east, which is out by Santa uh San Bernardino, which was, I don't know, maybe 50 or 100 miles out from Los Angeles. And there was some really heavy white clouds out there in the horizon. And I saw a little black dot on that on that cloud. And it was very distinctively little black dot. And I thought to myself, anything that I can see from out 50 miles away as a black dot must be big. I'm wondering what in the world am I seeing that far away? And so I stared at this black dot, and since there were so many white clouds between uh, L.A. and San Bernardino, I could watch it as it was coming toward me. And as it got close to Los Angeles, as it came in close, it came right over my head. And I was the only one there, but I saw a pterodactyl. This incredible uh, bird was so enormous, so huge. I recognized it instantly. I know what a pterodactyl was supposed to have looked like from all the artwork, and etc. And so this thing was enormous. It looked like a, a 747, but it was not flapping its wings. It wasn't flapping its wings. It was. It was caught in the stream of air and going extremely fast. It passed over me like four to five times faster than a 747 would. But it was enormous in size. And it went straight out toward the ocean, uh, toward Santa Monica. And I was, uh, I, my mouth was open. I couldn't believe I'm seeing a pterodactyl. And as it went over me, it went toward the ocean. Santa Monica uh, was uh, at the ocean. And I watched it as it was going towards Santa Monica, and there was a heavy cloud mass out over the Pacific uh, off the coast of Santa Monica. And out of that heavy cloud mass, five other pterodactyls came out one by one. They were following each other. The first one came out of the, 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 the uh, cloud mass. The next one followed, the next one followed after that, and eventually all five of these pterodactyls came out of the cloud, and then the one that passed over me uh, came and joined them as if they were expecting him or something. But it, it, the one that flew over me went out and joined them, and then the six of them circled around the, the, the city of, uh, of Santa Monica, in a circle, and then one of them began to go back into the heavy cloud mass over the Pacific, and each one of the others followed until all six had gone back into the cloud mass, and they were gone. I saw a pterodactyl right over my head. I watched him as he joined five others. It matters not what anybody thinks or what anybody believes. I'm just telling you what I saw. Now, the mere fact that I know what I saw tells me that I was seeing a different dimension. For that moment, I was able to view into another dimension because pterodactyls don't normally fly over Los Angeles. But they did that morning for sure. And so I, 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 I don't know what to say about it with the exception that the idea of a different dimension now begins to make a little more sense to me. And therefore, 
what is really going on on this earth that we are experiencing right now and where is the human race all of us together what is actually going on in the in the world around us that we do not know anything about and that we are going to experience soon something incredibly large overwhelming I don't know if it's evil or good, whatever it is, something is happening to the whole human family. Mm. And I am, myself, I am uh, uh, very concerned. I don't know what it is that's happening to our world. I do believe that there's a higher power in the universe that men have called God. I don't have any problem with a higher uh, dimension of reality controlling our world that makes sense to me but i'm just saying the earth you live on and the things which have happened on this earth that have no explanation whatsoever and if you want to look at some of that stuff just get the book the complete works of charles fort that is an extraordinary book you can get it today just order it from your bookstore or you can go on my website, Jordan Maxwell Show, and you will see recommended materials. Click on it and find the book, uh, Complete Works of Charles Fort. Click on it, and it will take you to Amazon to buy the book. You really need to get that book, Complete Works of Charles Fort. In that book, a very thick book, it's actually three books in one, the man Charles Fort, back in the 40s, 30s and 40s, uh, he began to research all of the strangest phenomena which has happened on the earth that no one can explain. That was the important part of his book. Things which have been reported in newspapers, magazines, and on, in the media that have happened on the earth and he would document and footnote each paragraph, where he found the article, what newspaper, what date, what page. He, uh, the footnotes are incredible. That, in case you want to go back and do the research on it, he tell you he told you exactly where he got the story. But the idea is in the book, complete works of Charles Fort, he explains extraordinary stuff which has happened on the earth that nobody, zero nobody can explain. Well, you know, and, what's, you know what's interesting, Jordan, is that it's not just the, the work of a guy like this who can find newspaper articles about extraordinary things. There are individuals who experience extraordinary things that they never quite report. Or if they do, it's an anecdote many years later. I mean, I can give you right. an instance of something that happened to me in 2002, that I don't believe I've ever talked about on this show, which uh, I'll give you the very short version of it. But what happened is I went in for a surgery. And when I, I was put completely under, you know, anesthetized, when I woke up, it was the only time in my life I can recall that I had no concept of how much time had passed. Um, I, you could have told me that I was put to sleep two, day, two days ago, two years ago, two hours ago. It wouldn't have mattered. And when I woke up, I was unable to speak because the surgery was on my throat. Okay. But what was truly strange, and this has faded over time because I've had to reconcile it in my own mind. What was truly strange is that I, I can only barely articulate to you that the entire world looked different in December of 2002. Colors were different. People were different. The appearances of common objects, their relationships to one another, were entirely changed by my perception. I mean, there was just, I recognized things, but they were only vaguely recognizable. They, they did not match any of my memories. Nothing. Not my, uh, not, not my, my had, I had two children at this point. They, they did not match my memories as far as their appearances went. I knew who they were. I recognized them just enough to know who they were. I knew where my home was, but that didn't look the same. Nothing appeared quite the same. Over time, like I said, my mind sort of, you know, made peace with it. But to be honest with you, toward the end of 2002, the entire world looked different to me. Sunlight looked different to me. Everything 
started to look different to me. Um, so there are the experiences that an individual can go through that change their perceptions ever after. And I can imagine that seeing a pterodactyl would certainly change your perceptions. You know, you're not looking at a movie screen. You're not asleep. You haven't done any drugs. Oh, there's a pterodactyl. Uh, and, and I'm not arguing with you that that's what you saw. Now, all of that, when you think about what I just said and what you just said both together, it seems like maybe the concept that the listener was asking about, about the computer simulation, seems a little more sensible because if you kind of tweak a program or you corrupt a file a little bit, sometimes it functions, it functions differently, things change. There's a little, you know, everything is supposed to be according to ones and zeros in the computer world, but the more you work with this stuff, you start to learn that eh, these things actually have a little bit of a give and take. There's a little bit of a margin, a blurry area here. Not everything is cut sharply to the numbers, right? So sometimes one program bleeds into another. A program does something it's not supposed to do. Programs break, you know, stuff like that. So if you can imagine a super, super sophisticated generator of a virtual reality that uh, possibly we are in that makes such, you know, wonderful sense, has so much depth to it, so much, you know, uh, uh, amazing diversity to it, uh, so many amazing organizing principles and interactions and characters and colors and everything, right? Absolutely. Every once in a while, there, there could be something that's like a, a glitch, a problem, a uh, a happy mistake even. Maybe there's some things that happen where it's like, you know what, it's better that way that it's broken. Um, and, it, it you know, I, I'm not saying that I absolutely agree with the idea that we're living in a simulation, but I certainly can't discount it. And it sounds to me like you're saying, basically, listen, I don't have proof that that's the way it is, but I don't think anybody could prove to you that that's the way it isn't either, right? <laughs> That's my feeling. I, uh, I, my feeling is is that I've heard and actually with my own eyes seen too much in my life. I, I, that's, my life has been filled with extraordinary experiences. And I, I, so I just have to look at the whole of my life's experiences. And so much of it is, is uh, unexplainable why I would be in a place and see what I saw and 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 they have the experience that I did that no one else saw. And then I have people tell me in minute detail something two years ahead of time that happened precisely that way. And then seeing, was it just a pterodactyl? I've seen some ah, incredibly strange things that are not of this world, but I was wide awake and sick and looking at them. And, uh, and, and I know that there's just a lot of, of things going on on this earth. And again, go back to reading Charles Fort's book, and you'll see it's just thousands of strange things have happened. Let me give you one example from Charles Fort's book. It's just off the top sure. of my head, but it was the one that I remembered. That it said back in 1860s, I think it was, 1870s, in London, England, it snowed very heavy one night. And the next morning, according to the newspapers and the magazine articles that talked about it, the next morning when uh, the sun came up, uh, London was covered with, uh, with a blanket of snow. And from one end of the city to the opposite end of the city <clears throat> was one set of footprints. They looked like about uh, a couple of inches, uh, maybe two and a half inches to three inches uh, long, about an inch and a half wide of a little footprint of some sort. But it walked all the way across London in the snow. One little tiny footprint, whatever it was, walked all the way across uh, of London in the snow. But the, cra the crazy thing was is that the line it walked in was so straight, it was a laser line. Whatever this thing was, when it walked, it came to a rock, it would go over the rock. If it came to a house, it would go up the side, go under the eave, walk across the roof, walk down the other side of the roof, then down, 
And so it walked in a perfectly flawless straight line across London, a little tiny feet walked across London in the snow. Now, what caused it? Nobody knows. How do you explain it? Nobody has in court and could explain it. It's just there. Now, what are you going to do with it? Another another story that came out of uh, Charles Fort was about a city that I have, and this is a long time ago I read this, but it, it stuck with me that there was a city in California, in mid-California, in this little Mickey Mouse town in mid-California, twice uh, in history, in the 1800s, uh, there would be a crystal clear day with not a cloud in the sky, sun's out, and huge boulders wearing, uh, weighing tons apiece. Some like one and two tons apiece, uh, huge rocks and boulders would fall out of the sky onto the city. But it would take all day for them to fall. They weren't falling at a normal rate of speed. Uh, you could sit there and watch them all day coming and they would take a long time till they finally came down and just as they would touch the earth, they would begin to bury themselves in the earth and the dirt and the earth would blow up around it as it was, you know, be impacted by these boulders. And the, and when it was all over and it's all settled, the boulders were, were sunk into the ground as exactly the way they would be if you had dropped it out of a, a plane or a helicopter, or whatever. It was dropped into the ground just exactly the way it would be. The dirt was flown around it just the way it normally would, but it would take all day for these boulders to come down, and people were standing and watching them fall out of a crystal blue sky, period. And then when I talk about little stones, no, we're talking about boulders, big ones. And well, where did they come from? We don't know. And you know, how do you explain this? Nobody can. That's why we don't talk about it. We don't talk about things we can't explain because it would imply that, you, uh, that you're that you a fool and you don't know the answers to things. And so that would make you look bad in the public eye if it's something that you can see with your own eyes and can't explain it. Well, scientists don't talk about things they can't explain. They don't even, uh, they don't even uh, relate to it. They don't even talk about it. Why? Because they can't explain it. And if they tried to explain it, that would, you would show them to be imbeciles because they don't understand what they're talking about. They don't know how to explain it. And so, therefore, now you're seeing that they're just people like everybody else. Scientists are no more smarter than anybody else. And so if they can't explain something and they didn't find it, then they don't want to talk about it. Well, I'm the kind of person, I'm fascinated with the world of the occult, the unseen world uh, that's that's all around you, people and places you are experiencing. You know, we have all kinds of strange experiences, and I've talked to people, and they, every now and then somebody will tell me, well, you know, just like you just did, they will tell me about their experience, and these are military people, these are very important people, doctors, these are and uh, people of, of means, people, important people in this world. But because I'm talking with them, they'll begin to tell me about experiences they had that was a challenging to their imagination, things that they saw and experienced. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying all of this to to basically say this. The world that you live in is not what you think it is. It's far, far more serious and actually frightening if you really look at what has happened and and how there is no explanation, no matter how smart you might be. Experts do not have an explanation on the stuff that's gone on in this world. Right. And, and you there know are so many books, so you know, many books. You know what's great about this, though, is that actually you've spawned a couple of interesting commentaries that have come at me now. Uh, one of them, which I, I want to focus on really quickly, because I've had this experience as well, where uh, where I've talked to uh, just you know on the ground kind of soldiers who have been involved in uh, various uh, 
various activities. You know, uh, I've spoken with a lot of Vietnam veterans, for instance. Uh, I've spoken to, uh, you know, veterans of uh, various Persian Gulf uh, engagements, let's say. Um, <clears throat> I've spoken to people from the Korean War. I've spoken to World War II veterans. Okay. But uh, a lot a lot of Vietnam veterans, because that is an area of interest for me. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them have reported some very strange things. Uh, things that, uh, that, that they identify as either, you know, alien activity or, uh, natural occurrences, creatures that they cannot explain, that they, that they are told do not exist, uh, you know, stuff like that. And I find it really fascinating too that you said scientists want to tell you that, uh, you know, dismiss a lot of these things. They certainly do. But what religion does with it is really interesting. When you, uh, you know, you go to a pastor and you try and explain some of this, right? And if they believe you, if they believe that you're legitimate about the report you're giving, um, they will tell you that, uh, you know, it's either God's will or it's something demonic, right? right. Um, quite often, like you were talking about your friend who knew the exact details of something that might occur uh, a year, two years ahead. And uh, there, there are the rare people. A lot of people think they're psychic. They're not. But truth is, there is a rare occurrence out there. There are some people that can simply see things long before they happen, and they can see a great many details, maybe not all of them, but uh, they can see some interesting <laughs> details. And uh, some people would say that either this is good or evil. You know what I mean? Especially with religion, right? Uh, uh, psychics are evil. They are yep. they are part of the uh, the devil's work, if you will. Uh, and, and they would tell you that, that perhaps you saw that pterodactyl because you were in an area where there's a great deal of evil. So this is part of the devil's deception and, and things like that. And at the end of the day, if they think that something is benign or at least is not directly harmful or they can't really tie it to the devil, then they'll just tell you it's God's will. But the truth is that uh, they don't have any more or less of an understanding of <laughs> this esoteric stuff than the scientist does, really. Uh, no, a scientist can I know debunk, that. You know, a, a scientist can debunk a lot of uh, things, and, and people do make up stories. People have imaginations. People take drugs, uh, you know, where they go somewhere else for a little while, <laughs> but it's not really this reality, uh, you know, and, and things like that. But the truth is that uh, re religion as it stands, organized religion, seems to uh, to be there to get you to stop asking questions as opposed to answering them. And yep. uh, especially when you're talking about something that's really outside of the realm of uh, the typical, I guess I would say. I, I, I don't yep. I, I don't want to call it abnormal or, you know, or even uh, uh, paranormal or any of that. I, I'd rather say the atypical experience. <laughs> They'll often yes. try and direct you into this. Well, it's either a, a, the work of the devil or it's the work of God. And that's it. That's the end of the discussion. Well, I like what um, what uh, the scientist, my my dear my dear friend Stanton Friedman, said once in answer to uh, questioning him about the the presence of flying saucers and aliens. And he said the same people that will tell you that they saw an alien or flying saucers or whatever. And he said, and you want to laugh at that, uh, but if that same person went into the court. And put their hand on the Bible and swore that you that they saw you with their own eyes kill someone. You'd have a very difficult problem in your life because you have better find out how to prove them wrong, because they are an eyewitness and the court will accept that. Mm. The court will accept that if you say you saw someone do something, that's the way it stay, says in the and that's the way it stays in the court. And until you can rebut it and prove it wrong, then there's an eyewitness against you. Well, if that same person tells you uh, that they saw a UFO or a little small creature uh, that you've never heard of before, that's ludicrous. You don't. The idea is you can't have it both ways. Uh, one of my dear friends I was talking with just recently said, uh, and he called his cousin. He said, my cousin had had an experience. And he wanted to talk to you. So we called him on the speakerphone. And this young man, he was a teenager, older teenager, but uh, I could tell he was really frightened. Uh, I could tell in his, in his voice he was really scared. And he said uh, he was telling us what, what happened to him and his girlfriend. He said, we parked. Uh, this was in Los Angeles. He said, we parked 
at a 7-Eleven store at about midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> and he said that we were the only car in the parking lot at the moment. And he said, we saw a cat uh, on this on this uh, brick wall uh, that divided the, the properties. He said, this cat was sitting on the brick wall looking at us. <clears throat> and he said, it was very, very uh, strange. It was looking straight at us. And he said, and then it jumped off the wall onto the ground, and it was a man with a cape. And he said, it was so frightening to us that we had no idea in the world what we just saw. This cat jumped off the wall, and in its, in its descent to the ground, it became a man in a cape. And he said, and this man stood there looking at us. And he said, he, he didn't walk, but he moved. Uh, he, he kind of floated from one end of the parking lot to the other end of the parking lot where there was another wall, and then instantly he turned into a cat and hopped up onto that brick wall on the other side. And and so this kid said, I, it scared my, my girlfriend and I, and, and I could tell he was legitimately frightened. And And so what do you make of that, a cat that turns into a human and then a man turns back into a cat? Well, that sounds interesting and all that silly nonsense, but I'm saying it's not silly nonsense. Two young people are telling you what they saw, mm -hmm. and if they are telling, and if the, and if what they saw actually happened, uh, what does that imply about the life that you think you are living on this earth? Nobody is thinking very seriously, and this is why I like. That comment when nobody is, uh, you know, when, when we all think the same, nobody's thinking at all. And right. so you need to question what is going on on this earth, what is happening to us politically that has nothing to do with politics. There's a higher power in the universe, the universe which is overshadowing our human existence. And things which are happening, the, the leaders of this world have no choice to do. They have no way out. They must do what they must do. And so what does that mean for the political and the social uh, uh, arrangement we call the human race? What is going on with the human family on the earth? It appears that we have lost our way. We've lost our vision. And going back to what the Bible said, where there is no vision, the people perish, meaning we are all dying each day and never realizing the implications of where we are on, in space, what our earth is, with the connections that we have to our galaxy, what in the world is actually the truth on the earth that we live on? Because we know just from hearing uh, every day stuff that's going on in government, black projects, we're being told that we today have technology that we can travel through the stars. We just haven't told you yet. And so I'm, uh, I've, been, I've been involved in too many people around the world telling me things and showing me stuff that it's just a mind trip. And we could talk about some of those things on another, another time, but... The world we live in is not what you think it is, and that's the bottom line. So if you think you understand God, you better go back and do your homework, because God is simply dog spelled backwards. And the spiritual implications of the human race and how we operate as humans, and when you're born, where did you come from? And when you die, where are you going to? And why is it that we see so many times ghosts and spirits of someone who died, but they have their animal with them. They have their little dog with them, and that was in the vision. People say they saw their mother or their grandmother in a vision or in a ghost form, but she had her little dog with her. What is that telling you? So I'm just saying we need to back up and realize that the world we live in is far stranger than you imagine and you better start looking at it 
intelligently and realizing something is happening to the human race and it's going to be involving the United States and us as a people and what's coming to our country and who is in control of the destiny of our people of America. Where are we going as a people? Mm -hmm. What is happening to our country? And to our young people, and to and to the human family itself, I believe we are in a very, very dark and serious time of finally beginning to wake up to the reality that is so far above our heads we don't even begin to know. And that's why I think the stuff that's happening, I see happening in our country today, something is going wrong. Something bad is is is. Something's wrong with our world system, and it's falling apart. And so that's why I, my, I would admonish people, you better go back and start looking at the reality of the world you live in. It's not what you think it is. Well, absolutely true. And look, we are just about at the end of the first hour here, so I'm going to remind people to go to jordanmaxwellshow.com. Uh, and continue to take a look at Jordan's work. Also, to join the Research Society, there is a one-time fee to get in there with a lifetime membership, and it's not bad. This goes into this subject, which we're covering tonight, as well as a whole slew of other things, recommended reading, videos, uh, you know, a, a whole a whole ream of images and things are being added constantly by your webmaster over there at jordanmaxwellshow.com um, and before I go to break I also want to say that uh, quite honestly if everybody was listening to this show just a thought real quick before we go to break if everybody was listening to this show uh, sent Jordan Maxwell a dollar in a donation even if it were just a dollar you know what? I, I, I realize that, uh, he could probably live for a couple of months off of it. Um, just saying guys, you, you, you write to me about what a treasury is. I've got two very serious questions loaded in the hopper for the next hour. Um, which they're kind of, they're kind of rough questions because they do have to do with current events a little bit, but also they're tied directly to the subject of religion, which we are covering. This is kind of a, a deeply esoteric discussion tonight. But uh, but this is a worthy part eight to the series that we're doing with Jordan Maxwell here on the Ocelli Effect. So, Jordan, we're going to take a break, maybe get a drink or do something else. But we're going to come back real quick and continue. Hour, the Ocelli this Effect begins good. now here at Ocelli.com. Do appreciate you for tuning in, regardless of how you're doing it. If you're catching it further on down the stream and all of that, we do appreciate you as well. But we are doing a live show with Jordan Maxwell. This is the continuing series on religion that we have been doing, and this is part eight. You can enter questions and comments in the chat room, or if you're on my Skype list, that's fine too. Uh, I will also take emails at info at ocelli.com. I have a tab open to keep track of that. If you have a question you wish to pose tonight, get it in. Um, not taking phone calls because I don't want to get thrown off track here, but... Uh, but more than happy to add your questions and comments into the discussion. Meanwhile, if you go over to Jordan Maxwell Show, that's jordanmaxwellshow.com. That is the only website which is actually Jordan Maxwell's. Lots of other things use his name. But that is his website, and that's the only place where you go to get in touch with Jordan Maxwell. If you email him through that website, he'll write back to you. Uh, you know, it might take him a day or something like that. You know, he gets a lot of emails, but quite honestly, I know he'll write back to you. I know that uh, if you send him a, a donation, he'll certainly be thankful. If you uh, sign up for the Jordan Maxwell Research Society, which there is a button for at jordanmaxwellshow.com, he would also be rather grateful, that's for sure. Uh, and you know what? There is more knowledge there than you're going to get anywhere else. Uh, the, the research society is a one-time $30 fee for like a lifetime membership, which is great. But, uh, but anything, interactions, I mean, obviously send some of these emails to Jordan about how, you know, uh, really great it is to hear from him. Let him know that you heard him on this show. I'd appreciate that. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, you could interact with Jordan and he is one of these rare treasures that we have access to and I'm extremely proud to have him on this show. So, 
we're continuing this discussion about religion, and we're about to get into some contemporary topics. Uh, unless there was something else that was still uh, kind of rattling around in your head, Jordan, and believe me, uh, I, I know it rattles a lot louder in mine because there's a lot more emptiness in mine than there is in yours. But <laughs> there is uh, there's possibility that there's other things rattling around still from last hour. If you wanted to complete them, <laughs> and if not, I'll move on to some other questions. Now, in part nine, I think we're going to have to go back into the Old Testament some more. <laughs> but yeah, it's but fine. tonight we're, we're going through some very interesting <laughs> esoteric odds and ends. And uh, I almost feel like that's what this ought to be called, the esoteric odds and ends uh, episode of this series. But anyway, we'll see how it goes. Uh, Jordan, is there anything you want to add into before I get into the next question from a listener? Yes. Uh, when you have, uh, especially Christians will... Uh, will uh, volunteer that what I'm talking about is demonism and devil worship, et cetera, et cetera, and that all of these silly things that I talk about, seeing pterodactyles and all of this is a bunch of foolishness or demonism or devil. But what you're not thinking about, Christians are not thinking about, look, go back into the Bible, into the, uh, into the Old and New Testament. And read about the strange things which happened according to the scriptures, when Moses lifted up his arms and and the and the ocean and the and the great oceans opened up and and millions of people walked through the the bottom of the ocean uh, when there was fire from heaven and and demons and poltergeists and devils and and demons and a man in the New Testament. And, uh, and, and all the strange things which God supposedly uh, did with changing the Nile and making it go to changing the Nile into blood and, and resurrecting people from the dead, all of those strange things which are, are powerful stories. But God doesn't do that anymore. He's not doing anything anymore. Why? Uh, and, but, but when you do have experiences <clears throat> and you do see things today, that's of the devil. Because, because anything that's not in the scriptures, that's of the devil. Well, what about Moses reaching out and, and, uh, and seeing the ocean divide itself so people can walk on the bottom of the ocean, on the floor of the ocean? Uh, but uh, for some reason, God's not doing that kind of thing anymore. He doesn't do any of those spectacular things in the Bible uh, it just he's not doing that stuff anymore. He's out of the business. And I wonder why. What are you talking about? That there was, you know, all these incredible uh, experiences that are, people saw in the Bible and talked about where they saw demons, they saw angels, they saw uh, great, uh, you know, things in the book of Revelation <clears throat> in the heavens. And you talk about the signs in the heavens. Well, yeah, there are 12 signs. They're called the signs of the zodiac. Mm. The 12 signs of the zodiac. So if you, you know, the Bible tells us to watch for the signs in the heavens. Well, that's uh, zodiological signs in the heavens. So I'm just saying that if you're going to condemn somebody who's telling you what they experienced, it's the same thing that if you were back in the biblical days, and, and God gave you a vision, people would mock you and laugh at you and say that you were crazy because you know, the Romans called the Christians, according to the history books, the Romans, the ancient Roman Empire, Christians were referred to as atheists. They were godless, according right. to the history books. <clears throat> Why? Because they didn't worship the Roman gods. And if you don't worship the Roman gods, you're obviously an atheist. And therefore, when you begin to look at Christianity in its very beginnings, Christianity was nothing but a retelling of a religion that was already in existence in Rome. In the Roman Empire, there was a religion called Mithraism. Mm. And Mithraism uh, was the main state religion that all, most all Romans uh, uh, began, belonged to and accepted <clears throat> as the major uh, you know, theological uh, truth of the day in the Roman Empire was Mithraism. Well, Mithraism later on uh, mutated, and it became known as Christianity today. 
But go back and read the history books. I don't write history books. I just read them. Go back and read the history of Mithra. And, and, and you will begin to see Mithraism was the beginning of Christianity and the ancient Roman Empire. <clears throat> uh, it's an extraordinary story about the, the coming down through history, march through human history of religion and philosophies and ideas about the divine presence in the universe that men have called God. I mean, there's all kinds of gods and, and, and belief systems that have developed over the tens of thousands of years ago. And I am totally convinced that um, all of these ideas have been given to us by higher uh, extraterrestrial minds that have uh, been feeding us these ideas. There's a scripture I found in the in the uh, in the um, Islamic uh, uh, what's the name of their book again? The Quran. The Quran. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm getting old and I've got too much stuff going on in my mind. But in the Quran, the as God says, we. I, I'm just paraphrasing. I'll have to find it and give you the exact scripture. But it says in the Quran, we. We, W-E, meaning more than one. We have given you your religion. We are the ones who came down and gave you your religion. Right. We. I'm thinking, what do you mean we? We have given you your beliefs and your religion. That's in the Quran. Well, it's, it's obvious somebody higher up is communicating with us, with humans, and they're telling you, if you're reading the Quran and you think you know about God, well, we, W-E, more than one, we gave you your religion. We are the ones that came down and gave it to you. See, but well, you, if that's the case, you better go back and find out who's we. Well, that, that would be a good idea, but, you know, there, there, there's something to be said here. Because, look... There, there are those that believe that there is one chief deity, right? Uh, regardless of how many gods or whatever angels are below them, so on and so forth. There's a hierarchy. They come to this conclusion that there's one God, you know. And and the one God. Let's just go with their premise for a moment. The one God created everything. The one God gave you a tree. It doesn't necessarily mean you know what, what to do with it, by the way. Okay, you, you could turn it into a book. You could turn it into shelter. You could uh, just make it grow. You could let it flower and create fruit. Who knows? You, there's lots of things you could possibly do with that tree based on what's been placed here. Your life itself has been given to you. But here's an interesting thing, and, and I want to pose my own question, but also bring in the question from a listener with this. Um, and, and I pose this question to many a, a an allegedly learned person when it comes to religion. The idea that the one God, okay, and, and I don't believe that there's one, by the way, but okay, put my beliefs aside. Um, the idea that this one God created all things. They'll tell you that it's in the scripture they created all things. I could tell you that that scripture says Elohim, which means a plurality. But anyway, let's just take their premise at its face. If they created all things, then they also created everything that you think of as negative. They That's also right. created, you know, if heaven was created by God, so was hell. If That's right. the great representatives of love and truth and the holiness, the, the, the sanctity of life were all created, so was death, so was decay, so was disease. All of it goes back to the same author if you believe that there is only one author of all things which are part of life. Well, what's interesting to me is uh, is the question that's posed by this listener. And this does get into contemporary issues, which I don't often like to go to contemporary issues with Jordan, to be honest with you. But let's do it anyway, because Jordan said he'll answer all questions that are reasonable on here, so let's do it. Right, Jordan? Yep, I guess so. Okay. Evangelicals. These people that are called, quote, evangelicals at this point, they're an interesting lot. 
uh, they make a lot of moral pronouncements and they talk about their religion. Now, this is the setup of the question. They talk about their religion as the basis for it, that, you know, if you're not part of their religious understanding, if you're not behaving according to what it is they believe are the guide guides given by the Bible directly, then you are outside of them. You are not good. Only they and their belief system are positive and good. But it's interesting that they adopt somebody like uh, Donald Trump, <laughs> like various yeah. politicians. They actually mention a couple of politicians here, uh, including uh, uh, Roy Moore, Donald Trump, a few others. But basically, let's let's get the names out of it. And Jordan, they they seem to forgive certain people when they fit a particular agenda. And it seems more like politics than religion is what the listener is saying. Um, you know, what, what is that all about? Is there a, uh, is there a scriptural reason for this is what they're basically asking. Is there something in the scriptures that says, look, as long as the guy is doing part of what you want, you can forgive his, uh, his evil ways, but judge everybody else harshly because they're not doing your bidding is basically what the, uh, the, the questioner is asking here. Um, they wrote a very long piece here, but that's what it boils down to is, yeah. you know, this idea of uh, we can forgive you if you're doing some of what we want. But if you're not doing something according to our agenda, then we wish to condemn you, to interfere with your life and to judge you. What is the place of judgment for man in the equation of religion is the bottom line question from the listener. Well, first of all, if you go back to the book of Isaiah, I think it's about Isaiah. I'm not really sure which chapter. I think it's 51, but it's in the book of Isaiah. You can find it on the web where God says, I am, uh, I have created all things. I am all things. I create good. I create evil. I, I bring life. I take life. I create murder. I create death. I create life, I create good, I create evil. And, and, and I create justice, but I create crime. And so the idea being, if there is one God, period, over all creation, then whatever is in creation, that God created it. And so if we have demons and devils, well, where did they come from? Well, God created them. <clears throat> And, uh, and, but people do not ask the right questions. I've, I've been asking, uh, Christianity for years. What about all of these questions you've never been able to answer? I mean, you talk about, uh, that God loves us and, and God is protecting us, etc. But did God, uh, was it God that created, uh, uh the, the blood sucking bats? There are bats that, that, that do nothing but drink blood from other animals. Did God create that? Well, if you remember in the scripture when Moses supposedly goes before Pharaoh and he, he takes his staff, uh, he tells uh, his brother Aaron, give me your staff, and he takes the staff and he throws the staff uh, down in front of the Pharaoh and the, and the scripture said the staff became a living snake. And you think, well, that's incredible that just a stick on the ground becomes a living snake. Well, but the scripture goes on to say that the magic practicing priest standing next to Pharaoh, Pharaoh ordered his priest to do the same thing. And it says, and the, and the magic practicing priest from Pharaoh, they threw their staff down and it became a living snake. And now the two snakes are fighting each other. So I'm saying, as a, you know, I was 10 years old and asking in, in school, in religious school that I was going to, at uh, a very early age, well, wait a minute, if, if that means that the evil, uh, well, that's the devil's work. Well, wait a minute, if the devil can, can, uh, can create something that's alive, just like God supposedly just did, well, the devil created with his magic practicing priest, and the stick became a snake also. Well, then does that, does that explain to us where 
uh, 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 blood drinking bats were created or, or, or snakes which are poisonous snakes or animals which were uh, predator animals where did these evil things that come from black widow spiders that can kill you or all kinds of strange creatures that are, are deadly and poisonous where, who created them did the god that loves you create the poisonous snakes and poisonous creatures on the earth that kill uh, humans so you need to go back and look at the whole of creation and do some thinking about what God simply means because believe me the the human family has created its own uh, its own idea about God and about theology and Christianity etc but these are all the teachings and the thinkings of men right. and what's in really incredible in my in my mind is the fact that the, <clears throat> the two thirds of the whole New Testament uh, so many of the of not only the, the uh, what was called the epistles or the two thirds of the New Testament story and the Christian Christian scriptures was written by the a man named the Apostle Paul. Well, the Apostle Paul was actually referred to as Saul of Tarsus first, and later when he became uh, well, later when he began writing uh, for Christian scriptures, he became known as the Apostle Paul. But Saul of Tarsus, and even the, as the Apostle Paul, he was not a classic Christian. He never saw Jesus. He was never uh, taught by the apostles. He had nothing to do with the, the original Jesus. He was uh, uh, what is called a Gnostic, and he was a Greek Gnostic. And, and, and the, the things which he says in the scriptures is Greek Gnosticism. And it can go and can be traced back to the ancient Egyptian Gnostic religions. So the Apostle Paul that Christians look forward to as being the writer of two thirds of the whole New Testament story of Jesus was not a Christian. He was a Gnostic. And so uh -huh. if you understand Gnosticism, that's why there was such a persecution of the Gnostics during the early ages and during the early days of the Christian religion because the church did not want people to know that the Apostle Paul was not a Christian. He was a Gnostic. Go back and do your homework and you will find so much that's written in the Bible was written by people you don't even know existed and they were talking about things you've never heard of before. So I'm just telling you that the entire story of Christianity and religion in general requires you to un, uh, uh, to disconnect yourself from your personal religious belief and start doing some thinking on your own. Why is it that God does not provide uh, the incredible miracles he did all through the Bible in the Old Testament, New Testament, but he doesn't do anything like that today? Mm -hmm. and, and so many of his prophets were seers and fortune tellers that could tell the future and see the future and uh, and all of that well that's why that's fine because they they were working for god but if you do that today you're obviously a devil worshiper so i'm saying no somebody better go back and start educating themselves because the world you live in is the same world it's always been something is right. going on on this earth and you have no idea what it is no, this is all true, and it's interesting that you bring up the Gnostics because now I, I, I'm saving the Catholic question that was given to me for last, by the way. Uh, so uh, just because I'm now being asked, oh, are you going to ask my question? Yes, I'm getting to your question about the Catholic Church. But before that, because uh, Jordan had just referenced Gnosticism, I think it's only fair that we uh, keep the uh, context correct here. Um <clears throat> About Gnostics and, uh, you know, what it is they had as an understanding, uh, they are often viewed as evil or divinations or, uh, what's the other word here? Utilized, yeah. uh, in, in, inspired by evil, some people say. Okay, mm -hmm. he didn't use another word, he just used a phrase. Um, and Gnostics in reality are just people that, 
uh, believe in a slightly wider frame. For instance, there are what they call the Gnostic Gospels, which are now gathered into singular texts. I'm reading this. Um, and the singular texts now state that these are the books of the Bible which were not included. Okay, I, I know where you're going. And uh, yes, uh, look, I, I've read these things. I find them rather interesting. Uh, when you take a look at what was chosen to be included in the Bible, we, we started talking about that on another show. Perhaps we need to dedicate an entire show to it. But uh, I, I think it is worth noting that, uh, you know, Gnosticism, although it sounds awfully mystical and everything, I mean, Gnosticism sounds kind of like what it is. It's just about knowing and mm -hmm. uh, knowing something a little bit beyond the text and uh, certainly this does wind up encompassing some things that would be seen now as uh, the work of the devil, so to speak. Um, it, it, it was something that was not uh, a standard Christian the way that we understand it now. But, uh, but really, I mean, I, I don't view it as harmful or as, uh, or as an evil thing that must be, you know, oh, look, they're, they're talking about Gnosticism. Because it's another thing where we're going to get, you know, you guys are talking about the work of the devil as opposed to, uh, you know, the, the good works of God. But, again, if you've got one God, according to Isaiah, that created all this, then he must have created this smaller group of people as well. And uh, also, given the divine inspiration for the creation of things like, oh, I don't know, the gospel according to Judas... Mm -hmm. uh, which does not exist in a standard Bible, but is part of the Gnostic Gospels, so to speak, uh, as well as uh, the, there are various books, actually. There's, well, let me, let me uh, say this quickly. There's about 18 to 20 books. Uh, it's on my research website. I've, I've named them and, and give you examples on my Research Society website if you join. But there's about 18 to 20 books that are mentioned in the Bible today. If you get the King James Bible uh, and, and, and you're reading it, you will come across about 18 to 20 different books that are mentioned in the Bible as important. Scriptures in the Bible say, well, uh, and always remember that, that the book of so-and-so and the book of this and the book of that so there's about 20 different books that are mentioned in the Bible, but are not in the Bible. They are just mentioned in the Bible as important. And uh, and so, well, where did those books go to? And where did they go? Well, they were taken out of the Bible. And uh, why? Because they were Gnostic texts. They were Gnostic uh, books. And the, and the and the and the founding fathers, uh, you know, a long time ago at the uh, after the Catholic Church had their had their big, their great discussions and seminars where they discussed the scriptures. They decided that there's about 20 books in the Bible that that they wanted out. They don't want them. They don't want to take it out. And just forget it. We don't want to talk about these books. But the books are mentioned in the Bible as being uh, from God. They are they are godly books, but the church has taken them out and do not show them. Well, the original King James uh, did not have the book of Revelation, which it does today, but it did have the Gnostic Gospels in it. It did have the 18 different books that are not in there today. They did have it in the original. And then if you go back and look at the history of the King James Bible, uh, over and over and over again, the book of Revelation was taken out and then later on was put back in. No, no, later on it was taken out. No, later on it was put back in, back and forth, back and forth, I don't know, maybe eight to ten times. Mm -hmm. The book of Revelation was taken out of the King James Bible because they said it was nothing to do with Christianity at all. It has nothing to do whatsoever with the with the classic Christianity, so we take it out of the King James. And later on, a few years later, they say, "No, this is obviously from God," so we put it back in. So the Book of Revelation itself has been taken out and put back in at least eight to ten times, mm. and and there's about nineteen books that have been taken out. Period. That nobody knows about, but they're actually mentioned in the Bible. So I'm just saying, go back and do your homework if you want to talk about religion. No, absolutely. And 
Uh, even today, the Catholic Bible actually includes some books that uh, the King James, the regular King James Bible doesn't, right? That's right. So, Those are the Gnostic Gospels. Yeah. Yeah, some of them, some of them. But there are many more, uh, uh, yeah. quite honestly. And, uh, you know, so so there it is. And, and you, you could find a, a book on them. But, of course, uh, oh, if you want course. to study them, uh, yeah. you, you can check out the Research Society at jordanmaxwellshow.com. But right. anyway. Uh, the last question is this, and, uh, it, it is, it's an ugly question, so let's brace ourselves for a second. Um, <clears throat> okay. So the, the listener wants to know that, uh, basically because there are these constant, uh, controversies, which, you know, for those of you on the other side of the pod, controversies, uh, that, uh, that, that keep emerging from the Catholic Church. Regarding, uh, you know, the, the predator priests, uh, taking advantage of children. Is there something in their literature that, uh, what, what is the word they're using here? That, uh, that makes. Causes this kind of reaction? Yeah, yes. basically that's, that's yes. what it is. Is there something in their literature that, that yes. makes this seem to be, uh, uh, something that won't go away. Is there something in the organization, in the yes. organizational principles that promote this kind of behavior? That's that's the word yeah. he used. Okay. Yeah. That promote okay. this kind of behavior because it seems to, uh, although, all, well, they, they point out that although many religious figures are caught quite often in this sort of uh, pattern of behavior, that it seems to be uh, a disease <laughs> within the Catholic organization uh, uh, seemingly more than others, and they're wondering if there's a specific reason for that. That's the whole question. And that's yeah. that's based on the fact that during the time that we were off, there was a lot of revelations about thousands of victims, uh, not only in Pennsylvania but in a couple of other states. I, I know it's you know gone right down the memory hole once the news is done with it. But uh, quite honestly, if you've been keeping track lately, keeping score, you'll notice that there's at least two, three thousand more victims that have been recognized in a court of law over the past couple of weeks that, uh, you know, again, over the, the period of the last 60, 70 years were abused by uh, individuals in authority in the Catholic Church. And, uh, yes, the news media covers it for a moment. As soon as it's not shocking to you, it disappears. And then we wait for the next scandal to emerge. But they want to know uh, what your viewpoint is on uh, whether this is uh, something that is built in to the Catholic Church and therefore promotes that sort of behavior. Okay. I have an answer for that. <clears throat> I don't know if you're ready for this answer, but you said it was a very controversial subject. Well, I'm going to give you a really controversial answer. Okay. Actually, actually, if you do the research, if you really sincerely want to spend weeks and months and years, as I have, going through the biblical accounts in the Bible and then looking at the flow of religion from the three major religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, all three are based on a, on a far more ancient religion we call Hinduism. But if you start to look at the esoteric uh, hidden connections of the belief systems of the three major religions today, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, all three major religions today are based on the worship of sex, period. End of sentence. And when you begin to look into the biblical dictionaries and encyclopedias and really start to devote uh, years of your life to studying the words and the terms and the symbols in religion, you will find that the, uh, the all three major religions and probably most of the religions of the world are all actually based on the worship of sex, period. Okay, but that Jordan, a, I've got to stop you here for one reason. That, is, but that's a fact of life that can be proven in a court. No, and and I believe you, but I got to stop you for one reason only. If I were now, I'm just going to speak from my heart, from my position, right? Mm -hmm. If I were to become obsessed with sex, okay, um, I would chase women, Jordan. I I I I would clearly just chase women. I mean, th th this is what I would do. Okay, I'm I'm that kind of guy. <laughs> uh, 
this is something else, though, because this is the preying on ch- uh, upon children. And I, I got to say that, you know, you, you hear stories about cult leaders and they take on many wives and they uh, they, they have, you know, harems and they have, uh, you know, these group marriages and whatever else. And, and, and people do this. They become obsessed with sexuality and sexuality could be throughout this entire thing. But it almost seems like there's something darker than just that going on because you, you hear the argument now and then well gee if they just let priests marry then they wouldn't have this problem i, I don't buy that no because there, there's something there's something worse happening here it, <clears throat> if, if if priests became obsessed with sex and then 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 why is it that there's not a lot of women being preyed upon why is it that there's not a lot of you know i mean i'm not saying it doesn't happen it does happen but what I'm saying is that when you're talking about the preying upon children, victimizing children, that to me is not, it, it's not part of the same equation as sex being pushed forward. Sex being pushed forward is going to, you know, uh, uh, encourage you to follow through on your already existent uh, proclivities, right? Yep, yep, of course. Of course. So, so. What what is it? This is a little different, wouldn't you say? I mean, because like I said, if I were let's just imagine for a moment, I, I was a priest. Um, if I were a priest and I were, you know, mindset oh sex, 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 all I would think about is women. All I would think about is how many women I could get, how I could you know, uh, uh, you know, convince them to come be with That's me, right. this kind of thing, you know, multiple women, whatever. This is what I would do, but that is not the direction that this sort of thing keeps emerging in. I mean, yes, we do hear about, uh, you know, there have been popes who've had children, there have been uh, cardinals who've had children with women, they've had relationships, they've had mistresses, they had, you talked about the nuns and how they, you know, came into the equation. But this whole thing with children, it, it, it's got to be a different animal than just sex, Jordan, doesn't it? It's absolutely different, I mean, a, a different animal, but nonetheless, it is still sex. And I am telling you that if you look at the history of all three of the major religions, it's just profoundly filled with uh, with uh, scriptures talking about sex with children, sex with kids, young children. Uh, Judaism is filled with it. Uh, Christianity is filled with it, and especially Islam. Islam, you can you can actually rent a little five or eight, seven or eight year old. A girl for a night, and and it's referred to as a marriage, and you pay the family a marriage price, and then they will give you the permission, and the religion gives you permission, and there's a particular word for it, which it slips my mind right now, but in Islam, you can rent a little seven or eight year old for the night, and it's called a marriage, and you and you and it's a whole uh, ritual, a little ritual that you go through. And you are actually married to the seven-year-old, the eight, nine-year-old, and and uh, and then you can live like you're married with with that child. And then the next day, at a certain time, you have to bring them back, and the marriage is annulled. But that's actually in the religion. You can actually rent a child for the night, and and it becomes an actual marriage. And there's a term that uh, is used in Islam that denotes that, that you are merely renting the child for the night and having a marriage, a legitimate, de jure, real marriage, but for just for tonight. And you pay then you pay the price and you pay uh, the family. And that's that's perfectly permitted within Judaism, I mean, within uh, Islam. So uh, when you see all of these older men marrying little girls, go on the go on the web and you will see it. In the Middle East, where they have massive weddings with, you know, 30, 40 young men marrying little girls, five, six, seven years old. And they have massive marriages where these grown men are marrying six year olds and seven year olds. And but that's the, that's, that's the Islam. That's the religion of Islam, period. I don't care if you don't like it, but that's the name of the tune. And then, of course, when you get into Judaism, my God, there's all kinds of stuff in the in the in the Jewish religion about the, uh, you know, especially in the in the old Jewish 
philosophies and the religion that they don't talk about today, but it's in the it's in the different religious books of the Jews today. But the Jews don't make a big advertisement about it. But it's there if you want to go back and start reading in the Jewish literature about how the the rabbis said it's perfectly fine for an adult man to have sex and to live with a, a seven year old or five year old whatever, and if it's a male or female, it doesn't matter, and sex is sex, it doesn't matter if it's male or female, and to have sex with a five-year-old, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. That's in the Jewish scriptures, that's in the Jewish uh, uh, Talmud, and it goes on to talk about the difference uh, uh, that people may think are bad and wrong, but in point of fact, in the Talmud, talks about if a man has sex with a boy uh, six or eight years old, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not considered anything evil at all because the boy doesn't know the difference. So uh, there's nothing, no one's been harmed by it. That's in Judaism. That is the Jewish religion today. Go back and read it. Mm. Go back and get the old Jewish books, the Talmud and the Babylonian, or the, uh, the Babylonian Talmud in particular, and read it. Read what it says in English. It talks about uh, grown men having sex with little girls, five, six, seven years old. Uh, nothing wrong with that at all, period. That's part of the religion. Well, then you come to the Catholic Church and Christianity. Well, my God, if you go back into the into the history of Christianity, uh, you know, with all the stories about uh, you know Moses and, and all the the sexual stuff that's going on in the church during the uh, early Middle Ages, during the founding, especially after 325 with the coming of the Vatican, when there were children who were slaves, they were brought in. And that's, it's a whole mindset in religion today of the, of the interest that um, adults have in the, the youth and the beauty of young children. And so, but it's it's part of, it's actually a part of the religion of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All three are replete if you will take the mm. time and read their ancient books of all three major religions. You will find everywhere in the old scriptures, in the old Jewish scriptures, are talking about sex with children. Sex with children. You can get married to a little five or seven year old for the night. Uh, my God, I mean, it's all it's all there if you just want to take time and go back and read the stuff yourself and stop thinking in terms of being all holy and righteousness. You better go back and find out what these religions really are doing and what they really came from and what they're actually promoting. And that's why today the world is now replete, completely overwhelmed by pedophilia and sex with children because that's the basis for all three Christianity Judaism and Islam you don't like that go back and do the research yourself and you will find I am exactly correct go back and do it yourself you know what's strange about that Jordan is that quite often you see people uh, who are of one stripe or another pointing the finger at uh, you know, you, you see Christians pointing the finger at, uh, at at Muslims. You see Muslims pointing the finger at Jews. You see everybody's pointing the finger at everybody else, but uh, nobody takes a look at their own house. You know, that's right. Regarding that's right. this, it, it's kind of interesting. It's like, well, you know, everybody seems to agree that this is not a good thing to be participating. Right. And yet, everybody's doing it. Yeah. What what what, what <laughs> is this? I mean, you know. Uh, well, but look at but the actual the point I would like people to understand it's it's difficult to try and explain it, but the point I think people need to understand is that when you look at the Old Testament, uh, for instance, in the Old Testament Jewish uh, the Jewish system, and you go back into the Bible and read the Old Testament in the Bible. So much of what you are reading, you don't understand the Hebrew words. The Hebrew words are actually Phoenician words. There is no language called Hebrew. There is a Phoenician language which the Hebrews speak. But if you go back to the old Hebrew words in the Old Testament, in Genesis and Exodus, 
Exodus and in the, in the scriptures, you will begin to see if you translate those words, what they actually meant in the Phoenician system. And from, from the word Phoenician, we get phonics from Phoenician. We get also the word phony from Phoenicians. And so if you understand that these, the, the, the language we call a Hebrew is actually a Phoenician language and you don't understand what the words mean. And then you begin, what, if you do that kind of research, go to the seminary libraries. I mean, why do you, if you're going to become a, 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 a Christian pastor, you have to go to a seminary. We have something called a seminaries. Why? It's because if you're going to be a priest or, or a clergyman, you got to go to a seminary. Why? Because the whole religion itself is based on sex. This is why it's called Mother Church. Mm. This is you know, it, It's a very big subject that most people have never had the opportunity to be told and shown. And I would love to do that. I, uh, there are so many things I would love to show you in a video, and that's one of the things I'm going to be doing on my research society. Is I'm going to be uh, my my webmaster tells me it looks like I'll be able to uh, create these uh, research uh, videos and put them uh, to stream on my research society. So if you want to see all of my newest videos on all of this dark stuff of sex and drugs and religion and government and banking and how the world really works, not how you thought it worked, what the real story is, I will have it on my research society and you can stream it and sit and watch my videos. Right now I do have audios and videos on my research society, but I have about 17 other uh, divisions of knowledge on my research society which you have probably seen that's filled with all kinds of dark strange stuff that's in religion and government and banking and military stuff that most people don't even know it exists but it's on my website on my research website but uh, I am told by my webmaster that it looks like I'll be able to start doing all of my videos and streaming them uh, on my research society so people can go there and just watch all the newest videos on all these strange subjects because you have to see the words. I have to show you from the, the encyclopedias, the, the, uh, the religious encyclopedias, Christian dictionaries, what these words actually mean. And once you see it in its entirety, then you will see the entire three religions, major religions today, are based on sex, period. End of sentence. Right. And, you know, it, it, it's amazing. Somebody shared a, a piece of a video on Facebook this past week uh, and, and was referencing the series that we're doing now. And uh, you, you had said in this uh, very short video piece, it's an older one. But, uh, you know, the, the older ones are worth watching. Don't get me wrong. They are certainly worth watching. I am sure, though, that the new ones that you're going to create are actually going to get even deeper <laughs> into the subject matter. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, but the thing is that they put up a little, a little piece of a video clip on Facebook and said, you know, it was this part where you were talking about how, you know, the society has basically gone to, uh, sex and drugs. And, you know, rock and roll, I'm not necessarily opposed to. I gotta be honest with you, but, uh, you know, be, be, because there, there are various ways that you can utilize sound. Maybe we'll get into that discussion at some point, but not today. Uh, and, and they referenced what we were, what we've been doing on this series and, uh, said that, you know, you, you've really got to, uh, you, you've got to get into these things in the long form with Jordan, which is absolutely correct. They had like 15 seconds of you up there basically saying it's part of what you just said now. But uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the new stuff. And, of course, you can go over to jordanmaxwellshow.com uh, and, and begin to take a look at the public area, but also in the research society. We get into the language. We get into the military. We get into the governments. We get into contract law just a bit. Uh, we get into, you know, the laws, the legal system, so to speak, right? You get into... Um, Religion, religion, like we have symbolism. been on this one, and symbols and symbolism, yeah. 
that isn't even necessarily religious, but indicates the identity of people. Actually, it all traces back to an esoteric root. But anyway, discover that on your own, um, and and you can do all that. But before we're done tonight, um, you're also, you know, not only are you constantly building the website with your webmaster, uh, but you're also, you know, uh, doing your thing, so to speak. And I know uh, I'm, I'm going to divulge a little something personal here. You had stated that, uh, you know, you're going to be moving soon. And, uh, you, you, uh, could use a bit of help doing that. And, uh, I certainly want to give you time to say, you know, look, I mentioned at the beginning of the, you know, at the end of last hour, I think it was, I mentioned that, uh, you know, any donation that is made to Jordan Maxwell is absolutely appreciated, certainly. And if you appreciate the knowledge that he's imparted to you many times over the years, a lot of it is out there for absolutely free, by the way. Um, but, you know, if you've appreciated that and you want to support him, first of all, go to jordanmaxwellshow.com. You can find ways to support him there, and here's a couple of the ways you can do it. Uh, joining the Research Society, I'm sure that'll make Jordan happy, like I said, and also, you know what, it helps him out. But, you know, if you just feel as though you've gotten some value out of the shows that uh, that I've done with him, out of the shows that various other talk show hosts have done with him over the years, if you've gotten some value out of some YouTube videos that you've seen with him on them, great, wonderful. You feel as though you can give something back, you know, a little value for value. Somebody delivered you some truth, right? Somebody delivers you a pizza. You feel obligated. You should give him a tip. How about a tip for the guy who gives you truth? Okay. And um, <clears throat> so so here I am. <laughs> Saying all this, uh, you know, and, and I hope I'm not making you uncomfortable, Jordan. It's just that I think it's absolutely necessary to point out to people that this is something which could help you at any time. None of us that are in this kind of business in any way, shape or form are making fortunes. I got to I got to disclose that right up front. It's not as though. Listen, if I had the money to give to Jordan, I'd give it to him. I really would. And if I find that I have some money pretty soon, I'm going to give some to Jordan Maxwell. I'm telling you guys that right now. But you know what? You're out there listening. You're out there learning. You're out there getting your eyes opened. And somebody is helping you to see beyond the illusions, to see outside of the cave, to see past the shadows on the wall. It's got some value, I figure. And a little something might just actually go a long way. And, uh, you know, that goes for all of us. But Jordan Maxwell is one of these guys who has inspired people like me, who has inspired others, who has, you know, Jeffrey Matt's been on this show, absolutely states that, you know, Jordan was not only his friend and mentor, but was somebody who inspired him to look into other directions. All of that has been done in the course of, you know, uh, more than half a century now of Jordan's exploration. And... Hey, you know what? Like I said, it is worthy of whatever it is that you feel as though you could contribute to Jordan. So there is a donate button at jordanmaxwellshow.com. There is the Research Society, which I said before, only costs $30 lifetime, right? So you got a lifetime subscription. It is $30, right, Jordan? Yes, it is. $30 for a lifetime subscription. Not bad at all. And there is a lot of in-depth information there. Plus, plus, there are many terabytes of information about to be added, and Jordan just said there's going to be new videos there. And I well, guarantee yeah, you nobody else is going to be able to uh, yeah, <laughs> utilize them right. as they have in the past. So, again, you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, and if you can find your way to joining the Research Society, kicking in something, sending an email, whatever it is, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, uh it is absolutely worth whatever value you've gotten from these discussions and the many, many times. I mean, look, I even came across, I don't know how you feel about this, but, you know, I, I was uh, re-watching some documentaries, some old ones I had on a computer the other day just because I needed something on while I was working on something and I wanted to have something to listen to. And, um, you know, you were part of uh, the Zeitgeist movies. No, I was the one that started it. Hmm. That's and what, that, I mean, that's what they that's what uh, Peter Joseph said. Jordan Maxwell was the was the reason why I, I did Zeitgeist. That's what he said on, on, on the air. And the whole Zeitgeist movement is now a political movement in thirty six countries around the world. 
which uh, the man who, who did the video said, Jordan Maxwell was the one that I was listening to, and since he didn't do anything with his knowledge, he's just telling it for free, I put it into a video and called it Zeitgeist. It went all over the world and saw by hundreds of millions of people. And today it's a political, it's a political movement around the world called the Zeitgeist pol political movement based on my work. But, uh, I live my whole life uh, on, on donations, which I don't get a lot of. And I, 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 I'm now and put into a position where 78 years old, I finally oh, I have awakened to the fact that I don't have anything. I don't have any. I don't have the finances to even get a decent uh, uh, computer. I got a computer that was given to me back in 1998, 99, and that's all I've got is just an old beat, uh, beat up computer. But thank God it still works, and I do the work I do on the on the web with an old beat up computer that's old. I live, I live on donations of which I don't get very much at all because I'm not out there ranting and raving. I'm not out there promoting myself as a world's foremost authority. I'm not out there doing that kind of thing. Well, I'm just, just trying to point out, out though, but I'm trying to point out, Jordan, that, you know, okay, yeah, you were part of that and say what you will about the Zeitgeist movement and the Venus Project and whatever else grew of it. But I'm telling you right now that I know that there are people listening to this show that were struck by that movie and that you might not even realize that one of the speakers in that movie, one of the inspirations for that first set of movies that came out with that title, all of that has to do with you. And I just no. want to—I I, just want to point that out because you have given a lot to a lot of people, whether they know it or not already. So I'm just trying to point out that this is one of the things that we need to recognize here. And again, you feel as though you've had value. You feel as though your mind has been changed. You feel as though you have been—you know—people use that whole "I'm awake," "I'm not awake," whatever. You know what? It, you don't even have that discussion without a lot of the things that Jordan Maxwell has been giving away for years. Okay, so that is my plea. I'm sorry to have interrupted you again, but I no, wanted no, to I'm make sorry. that very clear that this is, you know, and I'm not doing this just because, uh, you know, for, for, for this is not even for my game. This, this, I'm telling you just straight from my heart, this is exactly how I view it. And I hope that you guys out there view it the same way and will do something here. Okay, because again, if I had tons of money, if I had, you know, more than what I needed to get by, I mean, I'm living on about the same kind of thing you are, and I'm trying to take care of more than just myself. But I'll tell you something, if I had it, Jordan would have it. Okay, it's just that simple. And if you're somebody out there who thinks this way, or thinks that you've gained something, or, you know, you were struck by the Zeitgeist movies, or you've heard Jordan's lectures on YouTube, and you've been able to watch them for free, except maybe somebody monetized them, but trust me, Jordan didn't get paid for that. Um, you know, here we go. This is the guy, and if you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, that is the only site that is actually Jordan's. You put something in there, you will directly affect Jordan's life. That's right. simple. Yes. Okay, and, no, and I, I'm I done. Would, Go ahead. <laughs> I would add with that is that I live on donation because I I finally woke up to the fact that 78 years old, I have no income. Whatever comes in on people joining the research website, that goes directly to paying for the website, paying for the PayPal company to take uh, to take money uh, the PayPal company to do this or do that, and then I have to have security because there are people who are trying to destroy my website, and so I have to have security on the website, and that costs money. Then I have to pay my webmaster, and that costs money. And then I have to keep the thing, uh, you know, on on the on the web, and that costs money to have a carrier continue. And so I'm putting out hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month. Uh, to not only my webmaster, but to all the other uh, sundry, you know, cost of, of running a top of the line website. Uh, but I don't have any income. I don't have anything. I, I live on about six hundred dollars in social security, and after I pay rent and, and buy food, I, I'm broke. I don't have anything, and that's why I appreciate anyone who would, uh, you know, see the need. 
and and, uh, and donate anything at all is 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 helpful to me at 78 years old. Exactly. I've done the best I can do. I just ask others to help me. Exactly. So all of that having been said, folks, we are done with part eight, but we're going to do part nine and we're going to continue this, right, Jordan? Oh yes. Oh yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to have some really hot stuff for you the next time. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've got to, I've got to put it together because today has just been reminiscing over our old thoughts and old ideas, but one day soon I'm going to be able to put the stuff together that's really going to surprise a whole lot of people. Well, this That's was actually, this was actually, sort of a catch up episode because you had uh, been away for a couple of weeks. Uh, the the one day you were willing to come on the show, but your voice wasn't feeling really strong. So I yep. said, you know what, uh, we'll we'll just do it next week. The other week uh, you you had been away at a, a conference. You'd gotten together right. with some people right. and uh, uh, you know and done your thing, and so you couldn't be here. But you are going to continue this, and I am looking very forward to that hot stuff. Believe me. And uh, you guys out there, I know you're going to learn a lot from it. So, the Ocelli Effect is done here for this particular Monday or Moon Day, as it were. And I uh, do appreciate you guys for tuning in. Once again, Jordan Maxwell was with me, and this was part eight of the series on religion, which will continue here on the show as long as it takes to get it done. 